Um, everything we're talking about is going to be nutrition based and we're going to go through, through, through them this like beginning theory stuff first and then we're going to get into like the food stuff. So bear with me till we get to the food stuff. But one of my early realities as a vet was that um, I felt like I was doing the same thing over and over again. Like I was always using antibiotics and steroids and then things would get better and then three months later you come back and I do antibiotics and steroids and things would get better or maybe I do antihistamines. I just felt like um, I was fix I was fixing things temporarily, but not doing a lot of like permanent fixing. Um, and so that's when I kind of went. And I think all vets kind of start the same way. And then I think sometimes when you start to realize that, you branch out and you start to look for more tools for your toolbox. A good vet should, you know, for a good vet or a good anybody, a good carpenter, a good cameraman, a good anything should <laughs> should. If you can't solve a problem, you should add more tools to your toolbox. So um, for us, you know, for me, I should say, acupuncture, herbs, um, maybe some dentistry, um, and, you know, a big thing for me is food. I think food is one of those tools uh, in the toolbox, and I think it actually is one of the most important tools, which is why we're talking about it. I wish more people would come and hear about nutrition, but it's the hardest talk to get people out. CPR, no problem. Disease recognition, no problem. First aid, no problem. Nutrition, there's like crickets. So mm -hmm. this is probably the biggest group we've had for nutrition. But I, um, yeah, but I mean it, it's it's a it's an important thing. So is nutrition important? Well, um, if we forget about nutrition first and we just talk about our body, and all this relates to their bodies too. So when I say us or them, it's it's all the same. Um, yeah, nutrition, well, forget about nutrition. Let's just talk about our body. 98% of our atoms are replaced once a year. The skeleton turns over every three months. Skin is renewed once a month. Enterocytes, which are the cells that line the intestines. Small intestines are renewed 72 hours. Large intestines, 12 days. So our body is renewing itself. You know, we have this remarkable ability to heal and make ourselves new, which is cool. Um, I love who quoted this, but no single act or influence alters the environment of the cells of the body more than the ingestion of food. So our body's constantly changing, and what do we put into our body to help it have the energy change? It's food. And Perina thinks it's the most important thing that we put in, you know, that, that helps our cells. Um, this is Dr. Royal Lee, and I like to put him up here for a few reasons. One, I like his products, but two, you know, this was back in the late 18 through early 1900s. Um, so nu nutrition stuff has been going on for a very, very long time, and for some reason it's still something that's not catching on. But, you know, his quote, most people are willing to admit that the foundation of health is adequate nutrition. Few people, however, have studied the, uh, the subject of nutrition uh, sufficiently enough to recognize that most of the ill health today is directly a result of, of malnutrition, uh, which means we're basically starving ourselves to death, even though we have lots of good foods. And I mean, that was like back then. And I mean, now I feel like it's probably even worse, you know, because I remember, you know, when I was a kid, I felt like I picked more things from the garden and ate fresher foods and things like that. But we have an abundance of food, you know, but, um, you know, we're, you know, we're, starving to death because of it and we'll, you know, you'll see what I mean by that but he's um, he's actually the guy that invented the whole standard process stuff and um, standard process is one of the few things that we use but they actually are uh, they use whole organs and whole foods and their supplements so has there anybody ever heard of EPI exocrine pancreatic insufficiency it's a disease in uh, dogs and cats and humans um, we see it a lot in young dogs um, more so than anything, but your pancreas makes all your digestive enzymes, and if your enzymes, um, if you don't make enzymes, then you can't digest food. So if you eat food and you don't have the enzymes c kicking out of your pancreas, then uh, your food will just go out of you. So usually we see it in like shepherds or a big breed that around, and it could be any breed, but around three, they'll just start to waste you know, and, and you don't know why, and then you run this test and you find out that's what they have, and the guy that figured out EPI was actually a guy like Royal Lee, and uh, his daughter was dying, and he decided to just like go get a pig's pancreas and feed it to her, and boom, she was better. So, like the power of healing is sometimes in the organs themselves. Now, pharmaceutical companies came around, and what did they do? Well, we can't like package pig pancreas, so let's make up fake pig pancreas and sell it for like two hundred dollars a bottle, you know. And then then they have the powder that you would buy if your pet had 
exocrine pancreatic insufficiency, and that can be governed and regulated by the FDA, and it's very expensive, and you know, everybody makes money off of that. So um, his product line comes from whole organs. So if you had a heart problem, he probably has a lot of bovine heart and other things in it mixed with some herbal stuff and everything, and it you know heals from a different direction. And most people know that this meat is a lot less healthy than the internal stuff. Like, if we love liver, it's probably healthier to eat than breasts. But who wants to eat liver these days, you know? So, um, so this is called biojunk. It's like what we eat every day. It's the stuff that we put into our bodies. And what happens with biojunk is you eat it, and then your cells have to process it, right? So your cells have to break it down and turn it into pee and poop, you know, simplifying what the cells do. But let's say um, if you're bogging your cells down with all this stuff, if you hit the next slide. So this is the cell and how complicated the cell is. But if you're bogging down the cell and it has to, to work through all that junk that we're giving it, the cell actually gets toxic and then it can't do it as well. So if it can't do it as well, um, if it can't do it as well, then what happens? It gets stored in the body, usually in the fat. So if you ever hear those like, voodoo people kind of like me and they're like if you lose weight quickly you become toxic have you ever heard that it's because your fat breaks down and a lot of the crap is in your fat like that's where our body stores it so you actually that's why some of those people that do like more holistic -y stuff you actually have to go through a detox when you're losing weight because your fat releases all the crap that you like build up and it's why it's because your cells aren't working right if your cells were working right they kick it all out but how we choose to eat how we choose to feed our dogs messes up how the cells work which causes problems. So, um, again, they don't do some of this research in dogs and cats and stuff, which is why I have it for, um, I'm using the JAMA, the Journal of American Medical Association. Um, but they acknowledge in humans um, partial nutrition, uh, nutrient deficiency disease. So, like, uh, classic deficiencies are like scurvy, rickets, things like that. But there's subclinical deficiencies that we're seeing. And I guess the biggest one right now is uh, gluten, uh, not, 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 not the real, what is it called? Um, no, celiac's like for real, but what's the other one called? No, gluten intolerance, wow. right? So I believe in gluten intolerance, but a lot of people think it's like the new in vogue. But that's, that's an example of a subclinical deficiency. I think they do. Um, and, and you will too when I get done, <laughs> if, I, if I do my job. <laughs> no, but subclinical deficiencies are, are, are common. So like gluten causes inflammation and that leads to problems that we'll learn about. But there's other subclinical deficiencies such as like vitamins and minerals. Like how many people are getting vitamin B injections now from their doctors? Or now babies are supposed to get vitamin D like almost from the time that they're born because they're saying that we don't have enough of it and the sun's not giving us enough and we're wearing sunscreen and, and everything. So we, um, our foods are being changed such that, such that they don't, they're not as rich with minerals and vitamins. So maybe I don't have rickets or something else because I don't have enough vitamin D but, um, or calcium, but maybe, um, maybe because I don't have vitamin D, I'm getting hypothyroid. That's subclinical. They're not going to blame it on that, but it's something that contributes to me having hypothyroid. If you have thyroid disease now, they'll tell you to go on vitamin D, you know. Uh, any, uh, most autoimmune diseases, they're making sure you're taking enough vitamin D. Why? Because it's a subclinical deficiency. You know, your immune system's affected from not having enough. It's an antioxidant, you know, but it's also a vitamin. Um, so physicians, human physicians are learning to recognize that, that poor nutrition related to vitamins and minerals is, is, a, is a problem. But it's, it's less recognized, I think, in veterinary medicine. Um, in humans, the type of stuff that we see with subclinical deficiencies are decreased or overactive immune system, joint health, joint problems, seasonal challenges, digestive challenges, cognitive health problems. Um, when you think about, um, what's that one thing people have uh, where they don't know what it is, so they call it, um, like you, you just like don't feel good all the time and your joints hurt. Fibromyalgia is an example of, they think that's a subclinical deficiency or multiple things that come together, you know? So every case has a nutritional component. Every case has some nutritional component. And um, I think that that's, like I said, it's, it's important in my tool bag is my stethoscope is nutrition. 
Uh, again, what we know about humans, because they don't do studies like this in pets, um, but what we know about humans in high carb grain diets or high carb diets is that if you eat high carbs, and everybody had pasta, right? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> is when you eat pasta, it elevates your blood glucose levels, right? Uh, and when you elevate your blood glucose levels, your pancreas spits out insulin. Uh, and when the insulin gets kicked out, it also uh, spits out the insulin-like growth factor, which that growth factor is pro-inflammatory. When you break down carbs, it turns into sugar, which is pro-inflammatory. So any women in here that have had bad yeast infections at some point, they usually say lay off the sugar or the breads for a while because it's inflammatory, and yeast love that stuff. So... Um, so uh, when glycation goes through, which is breaking down the sugars, it basically, the, the end products of glycation bind to proteins, which ties up the immune receptors, which causes decreased immune function. And then lectins, which is a, pro, a byproduct of like grains, cereals, nuts, nut, uh, potatoes, things like that. Um, if you consume too much of that, um, you get allergic or immune reactions, which we see a lot, I think, are related to allergies, which is why... Um, if you've ever had the vet say go grain free from allergies or ears, it's because of all this. But um, uh, the most common effect that we see is the GI tract. Most people don't recognize that, like bloating. You know, you eat pasta or legumes, like too much beans and you bloat. You know, that's a sign that something's wrong. <laughs> you know, what do we do? Uh, watch TV and tomorrow it's better and then eat more. <laughs> but. But it's a sign that something's wrong. And that's what we need to recognize with our pets and with ourselves is that there's dis-ease and there's disease. This is so much easier to fix than this. So disease is when like you're hypothyroid or you're diabetic. Dis-ease is when you start to have the symptoms. Like, I don't know. Um, I probably picked a hard one by saying hypothyroid, but um, I don't know. Let's say before I'm hypothyroid, my facial hair gets a little darker or my hair is thinning a little bit or I'm gaining weight and I can't lose it. Like, but when I take my blood test, my thyroid is still good. Like, um, probably a better one to say is uh, pre-diabetes. You know, maybe your blood work shows you're pre-diabetic and maybe you have some of those symptoms like bloating or you're tired after you eat or things like that, but um, you're not drinking more and peeing more. You don't have like the full classic diabetes yet. You know, it's much easier to fix pre-diabetes than diabetes. What do most of us do? Say, oh, I'm pre-diabetic. I guess I'll wait for the bees to come, you know. I mean, that's what we do. A lot of people, maybe not you guys, but a lot of people do. They get the test from the doctor. They go, oh, shoot, my mom was diabetic. My dad was diabetic. My sugar's 100. It used to be 80. And the doctor says, uh, you should eat better. And then come back in four months and get that test again, and we'll see what's going on. You know, I don't think a lot of doctors, unless you have a good one, say, what's your stress level like? You know, what are you drinking every day? You know, what are you... Uh, you know, what's your diet like? You know, um, you know, let's do some, let's do like not only your blood work, but let's look at your vitamin and mineral panel and see what you're, you're deficient in. Like, I don't think most human doctors go to that stretch. Um, I think that they usually say, well, how much are you sleeping? Do you sleep? You know, like do you eat regular meals? I don't think they go through all that. They should. That would be preventing disease. I think most of them say eat better, lose 20 pounds and see in four months and uh, you're going to get diabetes. So, you know. Are you exercising? You should. Okay, bye. <laughs> you know? So, if you have a better doctor than that, let me know, because I should go to him. Uh, or her. So, or her. Um, so, allergies. Many, um, many foods, grain-based, will contribute to inflammation. How? So, we kind of, I just kind of told you with grains how all that stuff happens, but Inflammation causes cracks, inflammation, inflammation of anywhere. Our whole body's skin, our intestines skin. 70% of our GI tract um, is, I mean, in our GI tract, 70% of it is uh, your lymphatics, like your lymph nodes. Most of your lymph nodes are in there. So your GI tract is like the center of your immune health. So, uh, and your intestines are all skin. So when I talk about inflammation, I'm talking about everywhere. But inflammation is basically when something swells and then there's cracks and crevices so things can move in, like bacteria and viruses and, and things like that. But when we talk about like the GI tract, for instance, when you get those cracks and crevices caused by inflammation, um, then what happens is those bad things, whether they're viruses or parasites or um, 
well, so I say yeast or the wrong bacteria, they dump right into the portal system. That's where it goes, into the, the, the portal system, which goes up to the liver, and now your liver has to work harder. So your liver has to work harder to break down all that stuff. Um, and then um, if the liver works harder, that affects your adrenal glands, and the adrenal glands make your stress hormones and also all your sex hormones. Um, so, um, and if you make more stress hormone, what happens to your immune system? You know, it goes down, it shuts down. I don't know if you remember like flight or fight, but when you're in flight or fight, which is your adrenal glands making too much stress hormone, steroid, um, your immune system calms down, your GI tract calms down because you're trying to like live. <laughs> so who cares about your immune system at that moment? Mm -hmm. So um, so when we, our liver works harder, our adrenal gland gets stressed and our immune system goes down. So um, that whole cascade leads to a bunch of things, but skin issues are the biggest. So one of the hard, hardest things, skin disease is probably the one of the biggest problems I see and one of the hardest things I have um, with teaching people about that is we have to start with the, the gut. It's all starting with the gut. Sure, I can give you antihistamine and this, that, and the other thing and I can make the skin better, but it will never get better unless we go to the gut because that's where the immune system is and that's where, that's what feeds the skin. Um, so I like this because it kind of just shows you really like how everything's like interconnected. But like here's the duodenum, which is the small intestine. Um, solid lines means it gets stimulated by. Dashed lines means it inhibits. So the small intestine um, gets stimulated by the pancreas. And then you can see the other things that actually get inhibited. So, um, you know, the pituitary gets inhibited, the medulla gets inhibited, uh, the liver gets stimulate, stimulated by. Like everything's connected to just one organ. So I always, I'll, I'll, I like to give myself as a good example, where is the adrenal gland? Here's the adrenal glands. So when I was in vet school, well, I'll use these two organs. I'll start there, and then you can patch it through. But when I was in vet, uh, before vet school, I really wanted to get into vet school. And I wanted to apply my third year because I heard you never get in the first time. So I, like, worked really hard to get my college degree finished in three years. And I accidentally got in a year early, which kind of sucked. But the way that I did it was I drank Mountain Dew and, pizza, and ate pizza. That combination made me nauseous enough to stay up late enough to study all the time. So that caught, put me in constant adrenal. <laughs> well, now they drink Red Bull. Red Bull. Red Bull. That was my Red Bull. <laughs> it's probably cheaper to buy a Red Bull. <laughs> but so my adrenals were like, and then I did that all through vet school too. So my adrenals were, my adrenals were like on mad fire. My stress hormone was crazy. I wasn't sleeping, all that. So, um, you know, basically what happened is my adrenals, are my so and also was messing with my gut right I also was messing with my, my GI tract so um, what happened to me because of that and you'll see how it's all connected is I became hypothyroid at 21 um, I shortly thereafter became I got IBD IBS like inflammatory bowel I don't know which one because I didn't get like a, a biopsy and I got and I got prediabetes so um, the adrenals over here, here's, oh, and my liver values were, were high. They weren't like off the roof high, but they were like, you should get an ultrasound, something's wrong with your liver. Well, my liver had fatty liver. Um, my, um, I basically was stressing this whole system right here. And probably other things are messed up that I just don't even know about yet. But I'm trying to fix all that because I know I can, right? Because, <laughs> but it's serious. Like, like, at a, like just stress alone, you know, and eating bad can mess up major systems, you know? Right now I just have hypothyroid, everything else has calmed down. And I can't make that go away, unfortunately. Once you kill that, you're done. So um, this is VPI, Veterinary Pet Insurance, and they, t they put out the top 10 reasons for veterinary visits. I, I challenge you to find something that's not inflammatory. I go through that whole inflammatory thing because I want you to know how big, like, I challenge you to tell me which one's not inflammation. Don't feel bad. Like if you if you think you have one, definitely say what it is. They may have one that's not inflammation. I would think it might be the eye, eye infection. Mm -hmm. Well, infection is inflammation though. Mm -hmm. Like it, like somehow bacteria or something invaded and caused inflammation. Non cancerous too. B believe it or not, um, now Western medicine doesn't think that's inflammation, but Chinese think that all cancers are because of inflammation. 
Um, but you're right, Western medicine would not cause cancer and inflammation, but we can challenge that because stem cells are being used everywhere now uh, in different countries and in pets. And we cannot give stem cells to a pet with cancer. If you get stem cell therapy for your pet, you have to sign a waiver saying that we tried to find cancer and we told you that if your pet has cancer, it will make it worse. Why? Because stem cells seek inflammation and they grow it. So if I gave your, if your dog had mast cell tumor, which is a skin tumor, uh, a tumor of the skin, and we gave your dog stem cells, it would make the mast cells like go nuts on your dog. So uh, stem cells seek inflammation and heal and they're cells that don't know what they are yet. So um, in uh, Italy, they're actually hooking tumor necrosis factor to stem cells, giving it to the patients. They're using it for breast cancer and the stem cells travel to the breast tumor and take the tumor necrosis factor there and are killing the breast cancer. So that tells us, I don't know that someone would directly say that, but the way stem cells are working, it, it is finding it as inflammation. It's not going to other parts of the body that don't have tumors. Um, most people, a lot of people say renal failure. Uh, there are some renal failures that aren't, um, that aren't inflammation, for instance, if your kidney just gets old and shrivels up. But a lot of, a, a lot of them are nephritis. A lot of kidney diseases start with a nephritis, which is an inflammation of the kidney. And then it deteriorates from there. And, we, and, and you know, one of the things we'll do, uh, believe, which is real, like totally not me being holistic at all, but uh, even North Star, whoever, would put them on cod liver oil if they had any sort of kidney issues because it's a natural anti-inflammatory. And uh, it, they've got like real studies like from medical journals and stuff that show that kidneys do better with um, oil. Oil is amazing. The studies they have out on oil, like there's no body part that's not better for oil. So like when people ask me like, what do I give my kids and stuff like that? Like oil is always on the list for, if I could have every dog on oil, I would. If I could have my, my husband and kids on oil constantly, I would. I have to get that like fancy swirly Earl oil that they'll take from Whole Foods because it's like strawberry, like daiquiri oil or whatever. <laughs> Puts them right to sleep. No, it's not so It's like strawberries and cream. <laughs> Go ahead. But that's crazy, isn't it? That all that is inflammation. So there's a lot of environmental influences that we put on our pets and on ourselves, but um, you won't, I think, argue with any of these. Stress, air, water, food, lifestyle, exercise, vaccines, viruses, bacteria, funguses, parasites. Which one do you think you can have the most influence on for your pet? Which of all these factors do you have the most influence on? Food. You have a lot of influence over exercise, but most of you suck at that because we're busy. Like we have them, but we, do we never not feed them? Like, well, probably not. I mean, most of us make sure even if we're in a hurry, we throw down a bowl of food. So I think we, you're right, I would say these two, and even lifestyle, but I think that we're pretty bad at this. Most owners are pretty bad at lifestyle and exercise because we, we're busy. Huh? Whispering. No. Vaccinations. Oh, vaccinations. Most people are not, we do have influence over that, but the government does, and then most of you just listen to what the vets tell you to do, you know. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> Even water, because I give filter water, or they sometimes distilled water. Yeah. I mean, you have influence on all of this, but the, I think the one that you consistently are good on is food. Is food. Consistently the most, I won't say good, consistently the most influ yeah, in control of. So another Purina quote, because I just think it's great. You'll never use Purina after this talk, even though they say all this stuff. But diet is the one most important and controllable of all the environmental changes. By feeding carefully selected amounts of specific nutrients, we open the door to a cascade of changes that ultimately can influence the health status. Nutrition can influence biological decisions cells make about gene expression. Who wants to go buy Purina? They know it, and they still sell it to you. <laughs> just bought Merrick. Huh? Purina just bought Merrick. Merrick's a really good food, but it won't be anymore. So if you feed Merrick, get ready. Don't yell. I'm not yelling. I'm not yelling. Use it. Purina? Yes. And That's... my husband is on the fence because all the things that are going bad with Purina isn't the brand that we use. And I'm trying to tell him that we need to. That's why I'm here. Well, he should be here. He's a baseball. Well, that's I'm why really... Kyle's here. Huh? That's why Kyle's here. Because yes, he's going to put it on YouTube, and then he can watch it. And 
Okay. You have to give me that video. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, talk to your husband. Talk to your husband. Please. Get our dogs off of your arena. Please. Go ahead. <laughs> so, this is where most of you guys are. Maybe not you guys because you're here, but a lot of people are here. Go ahead. Sorry about the heat, by the way. Yes. Yeah, Quakers like it hot. It helps them meditate. <laughs> <laughs> Are you guys Quakers? <laughs> huh? Yeah. Yeah, it's like hot yoga and Quakerism all rolled into one. So, um, again, I said all this before, but I just want you to like. Hopefully, this goes in your head. Every every case has a nutritional component. All diseases start in the gut. Um, a lot of like psoriasis and stuff like that. Even with people now, I don't know if you need people with those diseases, but they often start in the gut. Even like regular medical practitioners who aren't like Ayurvedic, you know, or acupuncture. A lot of a lot of regular doctors are starting the gut with a lot of things. Giving women probiotics for yeast infections. That's not necessarily for your yeast down there. It's for start they're starting in your gut. So people are recognizing this is a healthy gut. So a healthy gut, um, you have uh, these are the enterocytes. The enterocytes are the um, the cells that line the intestine and they have villi. So parvo or feline distemper, those diseases, what happens is it kills the villi. So the cells can't actually take in um, the food. The villi aren't there to take in the nutrients. So we basically support them and, and hope they don't die and dehydrate from starvation before. The virus itself isn't awful. I mean, it is, but it's awful because it kills those villi. Those little teeny things die. And then we just have to support them and hope that they grow back. And they grow back, um, what was it? Uh, some of them grow back in, what was it, 72 hours and some 12 days. So that's why we support them for five, usually five to seven days and we're starting to see a turnaround. They don't all die the same day. You know, that's the other thing. Like, you know, with those viruses, they don't, every enterocyte villi doesn't die the same day. So that's why we have that period of time, like five to seven days or whatever. Um, so we have all this good bacteria that helps uh, keep out the bad stuff. Um, this is like a mucus layer. This pretty blue is like a mucus layer that also helps keep bad things out. Um, and then um, what else is in there? I think that's like the main stuff. Go to the next slide. This slide kind of shows you what different things do. This is like an, an illustration of a yeast, in, like a yeast overgrowth. But like, let's say for instance, non-steroidals. Non-steroidals directly affect the mucus producing cells. So the cells that are down here that produce the mucus, they get kicked off on. And that's why a lot of uh, NSAIDs cause GI side effects, because it's directly affecting the, the mucus production part, which is a protective layer. Um, antibiotics. Antibiotics kill all bacteria, good bacteria, bad bacteria. So when that, when that level is gone, you know, then things, you know, this just shows yeast, but you have to think about the other things that we're eating that aren't good that, you know, are, are slipping through. So, um, and then when the yeast come in, uh, that starts to affect, that causes the cracks, you know, like once the, the good bacteria is gone and other things are moving in, we get the inflammation, and then things can actually um, sneak through the cracks into the, into the body, into the portal system, up into the liver. So it kind of demonstrates what we were talking about earlier. If you have increased intestinal permeability, um, you get colitis in people, it's Crohn's and dogs, we see colitis, inflammation of the GI tract or the colon, leaky gut syndrome, that leads right to food intolerances, allergies, which leads to your immune system breaking down. So the, I'm just trying to like super duper prove to you that the gut like leads to all the problems. What you're feeding leads to all your problems, all their problems. So does it matter what you eat? Should you eat an unneutered male kitten is the question. <laughs> He's got testes. <laughs> it's a boy. <laughs> That's for the cat people in the room. <laughs> no animal was injured in the picture. No. <laughs> I don't know. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> no, it definitely wasn't. It definitely wasn't. Um, so nutritional therapy. It's really, this is another thing that's so hard because we're all so busy. And, you know, I had someone today, they wrote me back and they said, I don't want to pay you to talk because we had our first visit and we talked because I wanted to run a bunch of tests and do this and that. They weren't quite ready. And then I sent them a survey about like the symptoms their pets were having. I said, fill it out and I'll send you a plan. They filled it out. I sent them a plan. 
and then which was like let's change the diet these are some stuff i want you to, to put in your dog's body and um these are the herbs i want you to start and let's change your seizure medicine and then uh she called back and wanted to know pricing which we gave her and i said make an appointment you know so we can do some acupuncture or get blood work or get something going and she goes i don't want to make an appointment again just to talk you know but i was like it takes patience it takes talking it takes months literally literally if you come in with an immune or skin problem because those are the big two that take the longest i usually say you have to give me six months at least three to be convinced that things are changing but for like full happiness six months um, and i know the body turns itself over quicker than that but i don't know i really feel like Three months things are really good, but if you stick with it to six months, you got like a whole new pet, like literally a whole new pet or person. And um, does everybody play, anybody play the superpower game? I always play the superpower game with people. Um, when I'm evaluating you in the office, I'm deciding what superpowers you guys have. Because <laughs> we all have them. We do. We do. My lawyer has seven superpowers. <laughs> The more I hang around you, the more I know about your superpowers. And I'm actually building a team of like Avengers of my own, like House Paul's Avengers. And we're gonna be like the Justice League of New Jersey. Um, but we all have this one. This is one superpower that everybody has and it's called innate intelligence. And uh, I, I like this slide. Uh, actually, I like it because it's describing this word that only chiropractors use and people think chiropractors are nuts for saying innate intelligence. But this is a guy from Harvard Medical School. So you see how I like throwing Karina under the bus and Harvard under the bus. But innate intelligence is this. This is innate intelligence. And a lot of doctors will say there's no such thing as innate intelligence. But what it is, it's the wisdom that our body has to basically repair itself. Like we have that. We have innate intelligence. Our body knows how to heal. Um, our body has a super wisdom that favors life rather than death. And we depend on that power. And if doctors can let clients know, not, not just let clients know, like he's talking about, I'm, I, I'm saying clients because I have patients, but I can't tell a dog, you'll get better, you will. Like believe it and you'll get better. But we, they do that with people, right? If you tell them they're gonna die, they're gonna die. If you tell them, oh no, you can beat this cancer and you, know, and you empower them, oh, sometimes they do or they live much longer than, than that because you told them they could and you, you made their innate intelligence believe it, and, the, and then I'm sure they went online and read that they should eat fruits and vegetables and all that stuff happened, but if you let patients know that they have that force in them, they'll get better. They'll get better. Um, and unfortunately, this is hard to wrap your head around, but in acupuncture school, they totally believe in this stuff, so forgive me if this is going voodoo on you, but um, you give that energy too. So like, I can't tell the dog he's gonna get better, but the, the, the clients that believe their pet's gonna get better, they touch them differently, they respond differently, they treat them differently, and that energy that you give makes the pet better. So like, uh, when you hear about healing powers and all that stuff, which I have, it's a superpower. Um, <laughs> like in acupuncture they, school, they talk about like you can't be too tired or my, I won't heal, I won't give my energy to the pet. They're really talking about, you know, I don't have like chi, you know, maybe I do, but, <laughs> but that's what they're talking about. They're talking about that ability to, you know, use your good energy to let the pets know. So, um, you know, that we totally see that with, with patients that are terminal and in, in, in veterinary medicine, when the owners put a little bit more heart and soul into them, like some dogs that should be dead two years earlier are still alive. And it's all because the owner is putting their heart and soul into the pet, you know? Yeah, I mean, I can, I can think of like three patients offhand that should be dead and like they still have sparkles in their eyes and it's because their owners are like on the floor with them and petting them and like putting them in a, um, a what's that thing called that you pull a kid on? A wagon. a wagon to go around the neighborhood. You know, if, you, if you're assuming he's just dead and you leave him in the corner, he's going to die. But, not, you know, like when you, when you put your energy into him, um, they're going to live. So uh, nutritional therapy has to do with a couple things, mainly the food, but improving the diet, adding fresh foods, a variety of food, digestive support, immune support, um, improving the function um, with whole food, which we'll get into, and then um, supplements to support the whole body. So uh, what we do in Western medicine is we target one area, like your your knee's messed up, there's inflammation, let's fix the knee. Let's give you anti-inflammatories, blah, 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 whatever. You know, um, you know, 
that's inflammation. Like if you broke your cruciate, it's inflammation. You know, maybe it happened from a twist, but maybe the knee was inflamed. Maybe your joints were inflamed to begin with and it made it weaker, you know? So, um, and I'm not saying every dog with a knee problem, I put on all kinds of stuff, but I do look at what they're eating. If they're eating Purina, they're going to tear all their cruciates. <laughs> Dean, if you're eating Purina, you're going to make your cruciates. Um, that's Poor Dean. <laughs> Poor Dean. But, um, you know, so we'll get more into this, but, you know, I do think, I do think every dog and cat should be, and it's really hard for me to sell that, and I don't to many clients if they don't particularly ask because I think they would leave as soon as I said it, but I think every pet should be on a multivitamin mineral supplement. I don't think the food alone is good enough. My kids are on it. I'm on it. I do think every pet should be on probiotics at least three times a week. You know, I do it that way. You know, my kids are on probiotics. Um, you know, if you give, if, if, if you got antibiotics as a kid, for your upper respiratory or ear infection, you're messed up right then. I just proved it to you with that other slide. There was a problem that started right then. Hopefully, well back then they didn't give you a probiotic to fix it, but hopefully your immune system healed itself. But you do that too many times. Maybe back then, I mean shoot, your mom probably, like you probably had like 10 ear infections and they gave you antibiotics 10 times and then your mom played with the drugs anyways, right? So she had extras on the shelf. So when you had a sniffly nose, she gave you three days of antibiotics that she had left over. So you, everyone in here is messed up. At least, at least my kids' generation know not to use antibiotics like that. <laughs> but you guys are screwed. This whole room is screwed. <laughs> yeah. It does. It does count. But dogs and cats have di do have different um, bacteria than we do. So I don't think it's bad. And you have to see how much sugar is in the, the you know, cause some of the yogurts, that, like, but like, like the Greek yogurt, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think a great treat is um, yogurt, banana, or sweet potato, and honey mixed together, you know, and put them in ice cube trays or in a Kong. Like, I think, you know, honey, honey yogurt, and then like I said, peanut butter, or banana, or sweet yeah, potato. That's, that's for dogs, right? That's, that's good, too. <laughs> but no, it is for dogs. Oh, cats, um, cats love tomato sauce. They love um, uh, pumpkin, sweet potato, uh, a lot of the um, a lot of the fibrous stuff. Um, cats really like. Cats love tomato sauce. A lot of cats love yogurt. Cats like yogurt. Oh, I hear that. Yeah. 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 I mean, I use a lot of honey with allergies because if it's local honey that's raw, it's got a bunch of stuff that the bees picked up in it, and it's almost like a natural allergy serum for our area. So I don't think honey's bad. Yeah, it's important to make sure it's. Yeah. Yeah, but local raw. If it's got stuff in it that grosses you out, that's the good stuff. <laughs> you know, if you see bee butts in it, that's oh, what you want to yeah. eat. <laughs> <laughs> if it's clear honey. You see, you taught me about the local raw honey for my little JP because he was such a little, can I say bastard? Yeah. <laughs> uh, giving him the shots and that local raw honey really, he, he's no longer on any mm -hmm. allergy medicine. Yeah. It's not just the honey, but I think the honey is, when people, when we start to take things away, they're always like, what can I take away? Because after three to three months or so, you start taking things away, but some things stay. Like honey, I think is easy and it stays. I'm sorry. Okay. It wasn't this hot in here before. <laughs> What's crazy is that all the Quakers that come here are like ancient and I don't know how they don't die. Like literally. I guess so. Like they're like these little old men and women and they're like. They must have heart attacks every week. I hope they're not listening. Well, they, they, would, they couldn't disagree with me. Like, <laughs> we're going to have more lectures here so that they can get an air conditioning unit. <laughs> so uh, nutritional therapy, again, is food and the correct supplements. And the whole reason is of those things is to cleanse the liver, support the immune system, antioxidants. So multivitamin mineral tablets basically have antioxidants in them. They support the immune system, things like cod liver oil, probiotics, like those do all three things. Sometimes if a pet's really messed up, we'll put you on something to detoxify the liver. Um, I don't know if anybody in here has had that, but um, some pets I'll give like a liver cleanser with. So the big question that you all have is what do you feed your dog? And we're gonna get into that too, but everybody's different. Like everybody is different. So like I can't answer that question as a, I can tell you what I do for my dogs. And one of my dogs is a little bit different than the other three. Well, they're all different, but I do one thing very different for one than the others. But, um, but that's a hard question group-wise to answer. And um, I want you to realize that each one's different too, because um, a lot of people are like, well, this dog's having diarrhea or this cat's having diarrhea, so I changed it for everybody. Well, that would be great if 
everyone in your household, which I have eight animals that are not humans in my household, like I can't, I, I can't feed them all the same. You know, I have two cats with some issues that I, that as kittens, they had immune issues and I have a dog with an immune issue. Like it's, it would be great. And if you have a house like that, that's awesome. But sometimes when there's a problem, you can't just switch the food for everybody. Sometimes you have to be more creative than that. So the different feeding options are kibble, wet and dry, traditional, prescription diets, home cooking, and raw. And we'll touch on each one. Pitiful! Yay, Dean! Go ahead. <laughs> I'm going to show you two food labels, and I want you to tell me which one's the veterinary prescribed favorite prescription diet. This is food label one. Food label one, ground yellow corn, chicken byproduct meal, corn gluten meal, whole wheat flour, yeah. animal fat, beef, <laughs> beef! Rice, flour, soy flour, propylene glycol, blah, blah, some other stuff. Yogurt, carrots, peas, some other stuff. Food colorings. Oh, I miss sugar and salt. Is that your kill Well, I'm not going to tell you. You have to tell me which one. You have to tell. I'm comparing. 27% protein. Uh, animal digest. I will tell you if there's sugar, salt, or corn syrup, don't even buy it. If there's food coloring, don't even buy it. Um, I'm gonna, you should have buy this anyways, but those things are like super red flags, okay? Go to the next one. Here's the second ingredient, uh, the second label. Chicken byproduct meal, brewer's rice, corn gluten meal, whole grain corn, pork fat, powdered cellulose, dried chicken. There's chicken. Uh, and all this is stuff that's big words that chicken make this healthy. 35%, 35% protein. Which one is the prescription diet? I think the first one's the the first one? Because it has a corn in it. This one has corn. Uh, well, it has corn gluten meal and grain corn. And I, I, I wouldn't feed either one of those, but I, I know when I'm seeing Hill Science, I was amazed at the filler in it. Right. Well, this one is Hill Science, but okay. they're not much different. They both suck. This one looks like it has more protein in it, so you can't go by the protein. The other one actually had beef in it. This one had, like, oh, this one had dried chicken. This one has a higher, because it's dried, so that means it sucked all the water out of it. You know, so it probably is a little bit heavier weight-wise. But this is, um, if you go to a veterinary nutritionist from a university, they'll feed you hills. Because that's, we got free hills for every week in vet school for as many bags as we wanted. Um, this has on it veterinary recommended. Uh, this is uh, Hills ID, prescription diet. It's junk. Um, I think all the prescription diets are really junky. And if you read the labels, I don't know how anyone with an education of any sort could think that it was healthy to feed their dog. Especially paying as much as they charge for that. Yes, and if you're buying this stuff, you're paying a lot. So, like, hopefully you'll learn to. But, but amazing if you if you ever actually read the labels, it's amazing, and it's the number one veterinary recommended vet food. Uh, this is another label, uh, and I think you'll just see the difference: boneless salmon, salmon meal, herring meal, russet potato peas, white fish, sweet potatoes, salmon oil, alfalfa, herring, flounder, pumpkin, turnip greens, spinach, tomatoes, carrots. If you keep going every word you know, you might not know why lavender flowers are important in a dog food or why peppermint leaves important. Most of that stuff's digestive or anti-inflammatory or for the immune system. Um, these last couple lines are big words, but they're probiotics. But this much of it is real food. This much is vitamins to make it healthy. Whereas the other ones were this much was maybe real food and this much was vitamins to make it healthy. So do you feed your kid crappy food and then some vitamins to make it healthy? Or do you hope to feed your kids, well, I know we all probably do feed you know, what, dogs and mac and cheese and a, for Flintstones vitamins sometimes, but you hope not to do that every night. You hope to feed them food that they get their nutrients from. 33% protein, less than Hills. Which food's better? You, know, you can't just read the ingredient. You can't just read this. You know, some people call me up and they go, I bought that food you wanted me to buy. I think this is a canna. Yeah, this is a canna. I bought that food and it's got, you said I needed high protein. Well, it's got 4% less protein than the Hill Science Diet I was feeding. No, it doesn't. <laughs> First of all, it's all real meat, so it's probably got a lot of water content to it, you know, when they actually cooked it, which changes the, you know, the weight and everything. But you can't go by this. This means really nothing to me. Um, it's really like what's in, what's in the label. And as far as Dean goes, if you eat potato chips, you're hungry a little bit later, you know, so um, they'll actually eat less of a lot of good foods. And they'll actually poop less, too. <laughs> 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 
So it, it is hard to pay more, but you'll start to notice you just can't translate it to like I have to feed them the same because sometimes you don't, I mean, it depends on the pet and all that, but I feel like often they eat, they're less hungry, they're less fat, um, you know. So uh, simple rules to follow. Real meat is a top few ingredients. Real meat means, is fish real meat? Flounder is. So that's how they trick you. If they use poultry, that's not real meat, fish. Like it's not a real name of an animal. I know fish is, but flounder is really the name. When it's not the real name, like salmon, it's a mixed quality <coughs> ingredient. It's not like... Oh, yeah. No, that's what I meant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. But, but so be careful. So if it's fish or poultry, um, I guess that's the main two. That means it's a mixed quality ingredient. Mammalian tissues, mixed quality ingredient. That means it could be dog or cat. <laughs> Some, and I have seen labels that say mammalian tissue. And you don't want any byproduct meal, animal digest, meat and bone meal. Meat and bone meal is real meat, but it's a nondescript word. Nondescript words stay away from Good quality fillers. What I, you know, there's still fillers in my mind. Some people hate that I call them fillers, but sweet potato adds to the nutritional value. Um, grain corn, which is what that hard stuff that cows eat, doesn't add to the nutritional value. So we want fillers that add to the nutritional value. It should be, you know, real meat, top few ingredients, good fillers. If it has corn syrup, sugar, food coloring, stay away. If it says it has BSA in it, stay away. That's they actually had that in like Jimmy Dean sausages and I think in cereal, right? BSA. It's a cancer-causing preservative, so um, you want to stay away from BSA. And BHT. Do you eat cereal? And BHT. 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 Kellogg's. Kellogg's, yep. <laughs> You're dying. We all are. It's okay. You can't fix that problem. <laughs> um, so research your food. If you add up how much you spend, I, I spend more than $4,000 in, in, in the pet's lifetime when I add it up, like really how much you spend. My, how many, I think this is a totally like sexist comment probably, so if, if you're feminist, which I am too, like don't take it that way, but how many men in the room spend like, well there's only two, three, right? Men, do you spend like, how long do you spend researching a camera before you buy it? Well, <laughs> how about not him? <laughs> or a watch. Like do you go and do the reviews? Like, I feel like men do that more. They look at the reviews and they compare. You don't do that with the TV. Do any of the women do that? Like, research the stuff? Yeah. I don't have time to do it, huh? Yeah. Can't. But how long? How long do you research a camera? Months. Months. How long do you research your dog food? I spend Huh? <laughs> you do? Have you ever written the company? Or are you just looking online? Because you know they don't put anything out there online. Write the company. Write them and you should minimally ask them. What country does your meat come from? Is it human grade? Can I, meaning, can I pour uh, milk over it and eat it? Are all the ingredients human grade? Not just where does your meat come from, what country does your ingredients come from? Because it should be America or Canada or something good. Don't let it be China. New Zealand. New Zealand. Yeah. Uh, what, um, anybody that wants this can just have it. Like, just email Jen and she'll send well, it so you don't have to. Do my sign up sheet and put your email address. Yeah, she'll email you the copy of it. Yeah. Um, oh, what preservatives? On the first label that you had in there, it said that the package said printed in USA, but it didn't say where the Yeah, and that's one thing with food labels, especially treats, if it says, like, packaged in the USA, printed in the USA, distributed by. That doesn't mean it was made. Right. So you actually have to look for where it was made. It's tough to find sometimes. So... Where do they get their ingredients? What preservatives do they use? Research the preservatives once they tell you. If they don't answer you or they don't know, then you probably shouldn't get that food. The ones that are good will, will like be proud to answer those questions. Um, but you spend a lot of money on pet food. You spend a lot of money on pet care. You know what vets love? Chronic disease. We love chronic disease. Chronic disease keeps us in business. I should not, all the vets are gonna hate me. I might not put this on YouTube because if you get healthy, we're going to go broke. But I get lonely when I don't see you, so I'll, I'll come by. Okay, good. <laughs> I'm only telling you this so that when your pet gets chronic disease, at least I warned you. I'm totally depending on you not following anything that I tell you to do. But literally, like, why, if you research your cameras and stuff like that, why wouldn't you research your food? If you spend all that money on pet care, why wouldn't you research what you're putting into the bodies? Because, uh, you know, chronic disease is what 
and cancer. Big money's in cancer these days. We want everybody to have cancer. Well, I don't because then they go somewhere else, but big money in cancer. I'm, I'm joking. I don't want any of that stuff. <laughs> but, but seriously, right? Yeah, but wellness exams are like 60 bucks, 60 bucks, you know. Thyroid medicine once a month? Bam. Bam. Boom. <laughs> hundred bucks. I want you all to have thyroid disease. No, no, we don't want that. We want the pets to live long, and we want them to be 16 and 17. And you know, we're seeing that. You know, we're seeing labs, and, like, that didn't happen 10, 15 years ago where the dogs were living to 17 and dying of, like, you know. It sucks when their brain goes and everything else was good, but we're seeing a lot more senility, and we're seeing that in pets whose parents fed them correctly, or they had awesome genetics, but we, we are seeing pets living a lot longer. When I started out, I would say 10 to 12 years is good. Now I'm like, they easily live. The, like, I'll see a 14-year-old lab, and it'd be like, they look awesome. Like, you sure it's 14? And then the people are like, yeah, it should be dead. And I'm like, no, we actually see them living to 16, 17 now. You know, um, and a lot of it is because of how people are feeding and the education that people are having. And the vets are doing wellness stuff instead. And we're not pumping them with vaccines. You know, we used to give them vaccines every year for everything. You know, so I think all that stuff is helping their immune systems live longer. You know, uh, help them live longer. So... <clears throat> If you said to me what's the best food out there, I would definitely say home cooking. Um, I think home cooking's great. I don't have time to home cook. Like, I don't do complete home cooking diets. Um, but if you're into home cooking, um, use your vet as a resource. If your vet isn't a resource, then you should switch to me. But you guys are on my clients. <laughs> That's my pitch for house paws right there. Um, because most vets won't really help with home cooking. It's the wor I hate when people say, uh, I know you're a vet and you'll tell me I shouldn't do it, but I give my dog scrambled eggs and I'm like, like, I hate that vets have taught people that, you know, that they shouldn't give food from the table. It's such a brainwash. Hey, don't feed your baby table food. Feed them food from a can. Don't feed your, your dog's table food. Feed them, you know, crunchy, hard stuff that doesn't even look edible, you know? I've always wondered why, yeah, but I've always wondered, you open this can of food, okay, it says it's chicken or whatever. Doesn't it look like chicken? It's because we we're all brainwashed to like feed the companies of the world. Like you know, home cooking is where it's at. But how many of us home cook for ourselves all the time? You know. So you'll tell us what we can feed our dogs if we home cook. Yeah, okay. yeah. Uh, we'll we'll get into that. Okay. Um, but yes, I, I I answer that. Ask me that again. And cats. Ask me that again. Yeah, absolutely. Cats are a little bit trickier because of texture, but a lot of cats do like home cooking. Yeah, yeah. I have a lot of clients that just home cook for their cats. Um, there's also a site called balanceit.com. Um, balanceit.com you have to pay for, but it helps you make homemade diets for your pets. Um, some of the vets that I work with like balanceit.com. I don't like it because you have to pay for it. Um, where I feel like you could buy a book on home cooking that would like, you have to read it. I guess you have to read it, but I think it gives you like a little bit more information. It's not like a one size fits all diet. And that's the other thing. If I get to it, I'll skip it, but I don't think that there should be a one-size-fits-all diet. If you eat chicken and sweet potato for your whole life, what's the problem with that? You're missing something, right? We eat like crap, but luckily we eat lots of crap, so we get lots of vitamins from our different types of crap, so we're a little bit less nutritional deficient. But when our pets just eat the same bag of Purina, Dean, for the same day, sorry, every day. If he knew that we could give our dogs, he would cook. He would cook, yeah. But no, I'm teasing. <laughs> willful ignorance. We all do it. It's an American way. Willful, willful ignorance. It's an American way. Is it Dr. Klein's cookbook? He has a. Do you have an opinion on that? Yeah, he has a great cookbook. Yeah. Um, oops, I'm not done there. Oh, um, oh, so what I was getting at is uh, variety is a spice of life, right? You know, so if you want your pets to not, you know, people go, why do you think he's food allergic? He's been eating the same food for six years. Exactly. That's why he's food allergic. He's been eating the same food for six years, you know. But that's such a hard concept for people, you know. And I have to go, well, some people eat strawberries and then they get allergic when they're 20. And they're like, oh, yeah, but that has nothing to do with it. You know, they were feeding the same food for six years. That's why they're allergic. Um, the best persons to go to for nutritional training are vet veterinary acupuncturists. And I have my acu I have part of my acupuncture training. I haven't finished my nutrition training. I haven't finished my herb training. But that's kind of wrapped up 
in acupuncture, everything's kind of taught at once. But if you want to go, if you said, who should I go to? And I want to see a nutritionist. I would refer you to like one of those. I think they're called Masters of Chinese Medicine because um, uh, they go through intensive training about the, the, the body and everything else. And, and if you go to a veterinary nutritionist like Red Bank has, you're seeing someone who will recommend which Hills diet is best. Which I still understand why you get four years extra of school to record to the which hill they, they say it's like CD for this and LD for liver. So I don't think you need four years to just say ID for yo know, your intestinal ID, you know. <laughs> but so, um, so I would consider more of this person than this person if you were doing nutrition. Um, I don't want to go into uh, this is a whole lecture in itself, but I thought it was neat to show people, and I often will give people this. But um, basically, like Chinese medicine, the sh the, everything's balanced like yin and yang. Well, like yin, yin. I always, I still say yin and yang, but it's yin and yang. Um, like a hot, a hot problem, for instance, would be what do you think is a hot problem? Skin. Skin allergies is a hot problem. You just have to pitch. So uh, you wouldn't feed a dog or cat with a hot problem, a hot food. It would make it worse. Now, when you look at the list, like what's the, one of the first things we say with allergies is duck or rabbit. Uh, for a while, I messed up and said venison until I got into Chinese medicine. But like, I mean, vets like have been saying duck and rabbit. So it was kind of neat when I was in class because I was like, oh, that's pretty cool. We've been, and that's when I learned about cats and tomato sauce because a lot of cats have inflammatory. Most inflammation is a hot disease. So this is a very abbreviated list. I picked out weird, like I, I tried to like not have everything that was available. I tried to pick like very like things that you guys would see. But a lot of the times when people are home cooking, because I want you to do variety, which means if you go on to balance.com, they're going to say feed a half a cup of chicken and half a cup of, the, and you're going to have a boring diet with no variety. So you're home cooking, but you're still going to make them not have the spice of life. So I'll often say a quarter cup of meat, two thirds cup of filler. That's good. And I'll say, use your Chinese list, you know, use your ingredient list and then, you know, mix it up and don't think too hard because you should be cooking that way for yourself too. So like, you know, don't like overanalyze it, you know, unless they have a disease that we have to overanalyze it. Like if you have allergies, maybe we're going to overanalyze it. But if you have a normal, balanced, healthy dog, you know, we're not going to go all yin and yang on them. I don't think I can cook a <laughs> <laughs> um, There's no rabbit rescues here tonight. <laughs> Chance always chases rabbits. Maybe I'll just let him get one. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Raw food, um, <clears throat> there's a couple different types of raw food. There's raw food and veggies, uh, uh, like sojos. Sojos is a food that's raw food and veggies, and you add water to it. It's a dehydrated raw food, and then you cook your meat. If I have people on raw, that's one of my favorites because I'm not a big raw meat person fan. Why? Because I've been to slaughterhouses, and if you saw the meat, you would probably want to cook it too. <laughs> you know, Unless it's sushi grade, you don't want to eat raw meat. Um, in the United States, that stuff is not, you know, it definitely has stuff on it that we cook off of it. Um, raw commercial, I think is great, like Primal or Stella and Chewy's or things like that. Raw commercial is uh, uh, basically, they have tighter, it looks like dog food. It looks like pelleted dog food. They have it for dogs and cats. Sometimes it looks like in a roll and you like slice it. But um, they basically do extra testing to make sure it doesn't have listeria and salmonella. And, and one of them just got recalled because there was listeria in some batches so they did a voluntary recall which means no one was sick but they saw it and they recalled it was it selling chewies it was on our facebook page i can't remember which one it was if you're not on our facebook you should be because that's where we'll put any recalls outbreaks you know vote for lisa you know. <laughs> um com uh, let's see oh the commercial raw is often antibiotic and hormone free that should probably be another question you ask your dog food companies if you write them is your meat hormone-free, antibiotic-free? It's good to know. It might not change your mind, but at least you know a little bit since you're writing them anyways. Uh, raw from the butcher, I hate that. I have some clients, and if you're here and you have raw, like, I'm totally not, like, I'm yelling at you just as much as Perina. Like, you know, I get it. It's cool. I'm not really upset with it, but I wouldn't choose this. Why? Because I've been to the slaughterhouses and I, I've seen puppies with toxoplasmosis because their moms ate raw when, when, and then they were pregnant and they got toxo when the mom was pregnant and then the puppy comes out, you know, having seizures and problems like that. So it doesn't happen often. No. I eat brownie batter all the time. I eat cookie dough all the time. I've prayed for salmonella and I've never gotten it because <laughs> I would love to just lose 40 pounds. But... 
Yeah, raw bacon or um, what else? I feel like I feel like someone I in my family used to eat raw hamburger meat when they were cooking it. Like my grandma or something would eat like raw hamburger. Yeah. You know, so our bodies are built to like beat that stuff. Like whatever doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Like our bodies were meant to eat that stuff um, raw, but. Why risk it? And, and literally, the food handling in the, in the states is meant to be cooked the way that it's. It's not. It's not like you killed the deer and ate it that night. You know, like and actually, deer is probably better. But you know, the way that they process it, it it's not meant to be eaten and not cooked. Also, the butcher makes up the, the meat and the bone, and people that do that, it's called barf diet. Beans, oh, not beans. Uh, what does barf stand for? Uh, beef and. Oh, anyway. anyway, the barf diet is ground up meat and, bo and um, bones. Uh, the problem uh, with that is, again, it's not balanced. Like, and I know the wolves ate it, but the wolves also ate what was in the stomach of the rabbit, you know, which is the sweet potato and the carrot tops and the turnips and all that stuff. So it's really easy, I think, the whole food thing. I think we overcomplicate it. Uh, I think if you understand it, you can make educated decisions on it. Jen's texting instead of flipping. I'm looking up barf diet. Biologically <laughs> <laughs> appropriate so, raw food. Okay. So, okay. so our bodies are complex and so should be the food. Like that's the biggest thing you should take away is that if the bodies are all that complex, those one little cell is so complex, why isn't your pet's diet more complex? You know, I'll break and answer everyone's dying question. What do I feed my dogs? I feed my, I, t I like Fromm and I like Origin. They've kind of had a really good, long lasting, good company. I did send them a letter at one point in my life. They haven't sold a Perina or Procter and Gamble yet. And um, I, uh, I obviously work a lot, so I don't have time to home cook, but I'm really bad with leftovers. So literally, my husband cooks. He's an excellent cook. He feeds us very healthy food. And whatever's left over, which is always leftovers, goes on top of the dog's foods and the cat's foods. Uh, the cats actually eat right on the table, despite us not wanting them to while we're eating. Um, so they, my cats love peas and sweet potato and stuff like that. They like, they like fight over it, actually. And um, <laughs> so, do you get this what um, they eat with here, or do you give them another product too? Oh no, I, I, I like from Origin. Both. Well, what I do is I actually buy, I buy in bulk. I buy, mm -hmm. I buy every month. I buy four bags of dog food, two bags of cat food. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't care what, it's a surprise what comes. The first bag might be dog, the second might be fish, the third might be pork, and the fourth might be beef. And um, the, you know, the, they're all grain free in there. And, and like it, so Dr. Dana surprises me. She does the food ordering at the clinic to surprise me. Um, and then um, when I get down to half a container, I dump the next bag in and I mix it up. So they're getting a variety of different foods. Where, where do you buy that from? House paws. <laughs> Which we will soon have an online store with food and everything, but um, I, I, I mean, Amazon, I mean, you go to the store. I used to just go to uh, Spoiled Sweet Pet Shop, but they went out of business. Like PetSmart doesn't have that? PetSmart does not. PetSmart had, Wellness has been bought by, and, uh, and I think Blue Buffalo has been recalled. So the two foods I used to recommend are no good anymore. And, and they, the reason why you want to go to the local boutique type of shops is because they have different distributors. Um, Petco and all the, and what is the story you just said? Petsmart. Petsmart. They buy from the same distributor, which is Hills, Yukonuba, and Procter and Gamble. Okay. So they don't have the other stuff because they don't use that distributor. How do you spell from? F R O M M. Chewy dot com is great. Yeah, you can also get the Concord. Yeah, Concord. I've been feeding my dogs that for about five years. You know, yeah. And then I add water. Um, most cats are chronically. That's okay. Most dogs and cats are chronically dehydrated. I personally hate wet food, although I'm not opposed to it. I just personally, they fight over the can top and they cut their tongue and I'm a vet and I shouldn't have that happen. You know, so, so um, I uh, pour water in their food, like warm water. I, if you cook chicken or anything like that, I totally recommend that you throw the whole carcass in there, including the bag of good stuff that you throw away. Throw it in there, boil it, make broth, you know, bo bone broth, and uh, put in ice cube trays, and then warm that up and throw it in their food because it's got the, the marrow, healthy stuff in it. And you were going to throw out those gizzards and stuff anyway, so why not throw it in there? You know, after you boil it and get the good stuff from it, feed it to them. Now you don't, you don't get the bones; you're taking no, no. I make broth. Yeah, like broth. 
Yeah, when we have Thanksgiving dinner, we throw everything in a pot and we'll boil it and we'll make a broth and freeze it and put it in a big ice cube tray, mm -hmm. not ice cube tray, a bag yeah. for the pets and then we can warm it up and put it in this broth. Um, I have one, like I said, I have a couple pets with immune problems, so they eat a lot more homemade food than the other ones. Um, and um, I do give everyone a multivitamin mineral powder. Um, the immune ones get something a little different. They all get fish oil and they all get probiotics um, three times a week. Um, but honestly, that's quick for me because, like, literally, I'm scraping the plates when I'm cleaning them. You know, there's a and we and we have extras in there, like in a, a trough bucket. You know, for the next, you know, you know, if I don't like them too much. And obviously, if you home cook, you cut down your dry food because otherwise they'll get fat because you're feeding them what you thought you were supposed to plus more. So if you're home cook, if you're home cooking on top of dry food, cut your calories on the dry food, right? Because otherwise, you're just overfeeding. You if you're home cooking completely, no, but I don't have time to home cook completely, so I, I, I use a little bit of both. I use a little bit of both. I have a question. Now, cats are carnivores, right? Yes. So is it okay then to, like, it won't hurt them to give them the peas and the... Like, no, they, they graze on grass and all that stuff, and they, they should be eating mice, which they're not, which, and they eat what's inside their, their stomach. So, no, I mean, cats love... Most of cats' problems are because they don't have fiber, which is why we do grain-free. And their cat foods, there's, fi there's fiber, sweet potato, you know, that sort of stuff. So <clears throat> whole foods are important. Uh, whole foods are foods in their original form. They're grown in the ground. They're not processed. Um, and we'll get into this a little bit more in a second, but whenever you have a whole anything, like you pull off a branch of white willow. I don't know if anybody's old enough that the kids used to get white willow and chew on it. White willow branch, does anybody know why? The, my grandma would give my infant mother white willow bark branch to chew on aspirin. aspirin yeah before drug companies came around white willow bark was anti-inflammatory so the farmers would pull off a branch and that would be the chewing stick that they would chew on and it would numb the gums because it's anti-inflammatory when you change it when you the drug companies change it to remodify it to make it so that it's a drug they change some of the complexity of it, the enzymes, how it reacts, and the, you know all that stuff, and what happens is it doesn't work as good, and then you get more side effects. Which is why homeopathy and all that stuff was really cool back in the day. And Hahnemann University, he was the forefather of homeopathy, so it used to be a real thing, and all that stuff just went to the wayside when the FDA and pharmaceutical companies got on, and they had to regulate stuff and make money off of it, because you can't make money off of white willow bark. Um, flip. So whole foods are important to all animals, us and them. Um, so food synergy, and we're going to get into some studies that are going to convince you why you need to give them variety. Food synergy is defined as the added health benefits that foods uh, and their constitu constituents provide as a whole. And uh, this suggests that the health benefits of any food constituent will not be equivalent or greater than the health value of the food as a whole. So the piece is not as valuable as the whole. Um, food synergy studies, like real food, syner food synergy studies, uh, fish and broccoli study. When you combine fish and broccoli, and this was, um, this is, uh, I was going to say pocket pets. <laughs> this is uh, rats. Um, uh, when, you, when you gave fish and broccoli together, it, the combination was 13 times more effective in the reduction of lipid oxidation, which is uh, like a detoxifying thing, than one food or the other. So when you fed them together, how they work together, 13 times stronger. Four fruit study. When you actually ate fruit salad, orange, apple, grape, and blueberry together, the combination was five times higher with antioxidant activity than one alone. I never can say that word right. Marjoram, is that how you say it? Marjoram. When you add that to salad greens, the antioxidant capacity goes up 200% just by adding marjoram. So whole foods work well together. Whole foods work well Does together. It have to be fresh margarine or yeah, can you use the dried stuff? I mean, fresh I think is best. I think when you, I think the more, the more you process something, and we'll see that in a cat study coming up, the more you process something, you're going you're gonna to take away benefits. That's why even people that do the raw food diet, a lot of it's not raw, it's cooked to like 110 degrees because it's like right before things start to break down. Uh, when I had that IBD thing going on, I ate, I went raw, like hardcore raw. And it didn't work for me at all. I actually got lots of bloating, extra pain, worse than ever, vomiting worse than ever. And I went to an Ayurvedic doctor, and she explained to me, which totally made sense, and I don't know why I didn't think of it, because I was a vet at the time. She said, 
your body's like all messed up. Like how is your how is your intestines going to process raw food? Like it's harder to break down. So I had to go on prebiotics and probiotics, and I had to do lots of cooked stuff, actually. Like, I did lots of blanching and stuff like that. Even a salad was hard for me to digest. So I would do, like, spinach that was sautéed with... She was Ayurvedic, so what's the Indian butter? Because, of course, it's an Indian... Um, oh, ghee. Ghee. Yeah. So, like, like, I had to get my body able to eat an apple and not get pain from it. Because so that's why everybody's different. Everybody wants to say my pet's sick. I'm gonna get raw because I read raw is good. But if your pet's body is not healthy enough for raw, raw is no good. If your pancreas and your duodenum and all that stuff can't break it down, raw is no good. If you can't absorb the nutrients from it, and that's what happened with me. I, I went raw, like hardcore raw, and and my body wasn't able to take it. So um, whole foods act to um, act in a bunch of different ways. They're anti-inflammatory. Uh, they block angiogenesis, protect cell membranes, activates the body's detoxification mechanisms, promote apoptosis, which is the death of cancer cells, work in synergy with other foods. So anybody, this is from a cancer thing, but anybody that knows anybody that's had cancer and they decide to go like fruit and veggies and like hardcore, they have studies that show how, how much better they do when they eat whole foods in, in synergy. You know, they, they aren't... They aren't eating like one special thing. They're eating lots of fresh fruits and vegetables. Forks over knives. Forks over knives. Mm -hmm. What's no, that? The documentary just. Oh. Yeah. So when you take out this piece of the watch, the watch doesn't work as good. You know, I think whole foods work that way. I think um, drugs work that way. My dad injects himself with lizard spit. Well, fake liver spit, and it helps his diabetes. It's some product that Novo Nordisk makes. I forget the name of it. Um, but I bet you the lizard spit works 10 times better and probably has less side effects, you know, because it didn't get chemically modified. Like he, you know, I take natural thyroid hormone. I actually take thyroid hormone ground up into a pill. I don't take the thyroid hormone that's been chemically processed and made. And it's funny, my blood work was always good on that chemically made stuff, but I had side effects. Like I still had dark hair Which one on my face. I take, uh, I think it's called natural thyroid, nature thyroid. It's not the prescription. Armor, like it's armor. Not the prescription. It is, it is prescription, but I don't take Levo Levoxyl and I don't take Synthroid anymore. I did. I did take them, but I was still not losing weight. And I still was having hair thinning. I was like 39. Yeah, I went to a doctor that prescribed me the natural thyroid a yeah. magazine or something like that. Oh, yeah, I do. I have my energy did back. You know that the weight? thyroid medication in Europe has, um, has things in it that we don't have in it here, that is certain hormones. Yeah, it's the missing. whole thing. Are missing in it That's here that they have in Europe and they haven't approved to have it in the meds. Here. I bet you they're fe they're feeding the natural thyroid. I bet it's armor. You look into it, but I bet you it's armor. That that's natural thyroid, and of course it's like marijuana. Now they're like making it at the drug company, but they're trying to find ways to use natural products so they can still make money off of it. So they're giving pure marijuana and they're making pure real thyroid. But the thyroid I take has T three, T four, T whatever, T whatever. Exactly. Whereas uh, levothyroxine that's might just be like T three. Right. Yeah, okay. so no, I see a big difference. Okay. That's good to know. Yeah. And I have a lot of, I, I do have dogs who the owners were willing to try the natural thyroid, which is kind of, they haven't really gone there yet, but if I have a dog that's still having symptoms of thyroid, even though its blood work is good, I'll switch them to natural thyroid. I have a lot of dogs on regular thyroid because they responded, but if they're not responding the way I want, I'll talk to the owners about, do you want to try the natural thyroid? Mm -hmm. uh, food combinations in mice, this was a study done in mice. Most mice just eat lab blocks or stuff like that. But when mice were fed substances found in healthy foods like selenium, magnesium, vitamin C, vitamin A, um, uh, this is the study that I'm about to show you versus um, what traditional mice eat. Um, flip the slide. They fed the mice different things in different combinations. So if they only fed them like lab blocks, tumor incidence 100%. If they fed them one of those things, tumor incidence went down 50%. Two substances went down 32%, three substances 20, 12%. I don't know if anybody here has pocket pets, but we take tumors off of pocket pets all the time. Why? Why do we say? Does anybody know why the vets say? Because they're so inbred they get cancer. Has anybody heard that with pocket pets? Yeah, they're so that. inbred they get cancer. No, you feed them lab locks. <laughs> you feed them lab locks. Like, what is that? That's not what, what Wilbur's friend ate. What was Wilbur's friend? No. The rat. 
Templeton. Oh, Templeton. Templeton ate everything that was in that pile of slop. He didn't eat lab blocks, right? He would go steal the stuff from Wilbur's trough. <laughs> Templeton did not get mammary cancer. <laughs> At least not by the end of the book. <laughs> so can food have health benefits? Of course it can. Um, so another, I'm just going to keep proving it to you until you tell me to stop, but uh, nutrigenomics is a, another study. I'm going to show you like three more studies that like totally will have you like believing everything by the end. But that's basically when uh, food can turn off, on and off genes. They study this in autism a lot in people. Um, this is in a goatee mice. This is a mouse that has a gene problem um, and they're born that way and they basically are the wrong color. They're fat, they have cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and they die earlier. Um, you, can, you can flip back. That just explains it all. But basically, when they feed this mouse right here, so she's, she's messed up. When they feed her um, beets, onions, flip it. What was the other thing? It was like the methyl donors. Onions, garlic, and beets. Flip back. Her babies come out like that. So she had a gene that was wrong. And her offspring should too. But when they fed her those three subs food groups, the babies came back normal. When they did the karyotype, which is they look at the genes, the baby was normal. So they do studies on this a lot in autism. This specifically was one of the, go the goatee mice. That, so that's why if you have a lot of autoimmune problems or autism or sometimes, you know, they'll talk. You can't reverse a person that already has a certain problems, but um, you, can make a, a lot of, you can make them a lot better. You can make them a lot more functional because we can turn genes off and you know that we're renewing ourselves because we learned that on the first slide. Uh, uh, this was basically what was in the methyl donors, folic acid, B12, choline, and uh, betaine. I think I said all that. So pot and juice cats. Do you guys know pot and juice cats? No. How can you be cat people and not know pot and juice cats? <laughs> 1900s, early 1900s, Pottinger Cats, you should read the study, everybody should read the study. It's a, it's a study that basically over a 10 year period, um, they uh, were studying how cooked foods affect cats. And it's crazy that they did this and we still are doing the same thing we've always done, but they did multi multiple generations, 900 cats, and he had four feeding groups. And basically the first feeding group was raw, fresh food, and then it got more and more. The last group was like super, super processed food. Um, the last group of cats, like I think four generations out, were sterile, completely sterile, couldn't reproduce. In general, right. the cooked food groups, different yeah. levels. What? <laughs> <laughs> now you know how to solve the feral cat problem. <laughs> and you cannot spay and neuter them at four weeks old. <laughs> Just feed them lab blocks. <laughs> But the cook, the cook groups, and when you look at this, think about your own cats if you have them. The cooked food groups, I feel like I see this every day. Bone changes, dental disease, immune disorders, decreased activity, cardiac abnormalities, GI respiratory hepatic, fertility problems, kittens dying, behavior changes, osteoarthritis, thyroid problems, tumors. You know, we cause this stuff in our pets because we feed them Purina. <laughs> Friskies. You know, it's a cause and effect. You know, whatever you put into the roots of the tree is going to affect the leaves and the body and everything else. So, it's, it's really important stuff.